Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be doing this. Uh, it's it's really cool that uh, that we're doing this, and uh, I would like thank I would like to thank Micha and David for for joining us today. Just a short uh, intro about the podcast. The goal of, of uh, decoding top digital performance is to, as it, the name says, to decode what made digital companies successful and uh, how entrepreneurs behind those uh, those companies did it. Uh, we're going to to deep to deeply dive into into the mindset, into the into the patterns, uh, behavior, and move, all the moves that that made those, those companies so successful, or, or at least we're going to try. So uh, this series is it, it's powered by uh, Jess Guru company that I really love because uh, I work there and um, I work in business development. So uh, me and David have a lot a lot in common. What Jess Guru? Jess Guru is a software development agency uh, specialized in full stack software development, AWS professional services, UI UX design, and uh, obviously consulting in uh, those mentioned mentioned fields. In the first edition of the podcast, we are having Miha Laptar and uh, David Bozic uh, as our guests. Me and Miha know each other since 2018. We've been together in this really uh, cool uh, program that's financed by uh, State Department and organized by World Chicago. So we met in the US and uh, we spent months uh, together working getting to know each other and then exchanging a lot of thoughts on, on various topics. So I know Miha has some really interesting and, and deep, profound points on, on many topics that that, that are considered in, in an IT. So uh, David, as, as I said, or David, sorry for like English okay. in your name. Okay. Uh, okay. So David, uh, as I said, he's uh, he's the main guy when it comes to business development in uh, in Optivet. So it's definitely it's definitely going to be interesting to hear more stories from uh, Optivet and, and how you guys do business development. So uh, Optivet is a full service digital agency from Slovenia, one of the most successful Slovenian agencies. They make innovative websites, uh, e-commerce shops. They implement PIM tools and do digital marketing, right? So again, I would like to thank both of you for, for coming today. And uh, I encourage everyone that's, that's joining us live to ask questions. I hope my technical team is going to transfer the questions because I don't know. I'm not sure if I can see them. Uh, so... Uh, after the the podcast is done we're gonna edit everything and then publish it on all major podcast platforms but please uh use the opportunity and maybe ask questions that may be interesting to you and may help you in your journey of, of becoming a successful entrepreneur so guys i think we should we should like start with an easy conversation starter how you've been doing and uh how's how are things in Slovenia? Are things relaxing down? Uh, are getting are they getting back to normal when it comes to the virus thing, or or still you feel some some consequences? Thank you, Sergio, for inviting us. We are very glad that we can have this conversation. And yeah, in Slovenia, everything is going back to normal. I think that we are all quite relaxed and started to enjoy spring. And also business is going, uh, it's back on the track, back on the right track, and we are going up again. I would say one month ago, it was quite harsh because clients started to post uh, our services, our profession. But after that, I think the Corona gave us some boost because, as you know, digital is becoming more and more important because of it. So I think it's it's, it's good thing for us after all. <laughs> Yeah, I think that we have, uh, you know, some some bad things coming out of Corona, but also on the other side, there are quite a lot of good things, especially, you know, uh, everybody started to think uh, about, you know, if you're indoors, if you're locked, if you can't go outside, you know, how will you function, you know, <laughs> and all of the services that we are really dependent on are provided online, you know, even some, I don't know, uh, 
exercise, physical exercise, dancing lessons, you know, maybe, I don't know, uh, tuition, uh, stuff like that, you know, everything can be transferred and uh, communicated online. So this is also, it's not only a challenge, it's also a big, big opportunity for us. We are excited to live in those times. I would yeah, I would definitely agree with you. A lot of people look at this as not an opportunity, as something really harsh, and uh, but the essence is that we're together in this, like everybody has to deal with it. And uh, if you can think of it as an opportunity, that's definitely a better place to look at it, just like pitying yourself and maybe, I don't know, getting depressed. So let's continue on that uh, Corona virus topic, and then we can maybe transfer it to some other topics. But uh, when you said you had clients that like paused some of, of your engagement in, in their projects and that kind of stuff, uh, were they like getting back to you after like two or three weeks, month and saying, let's continue, or you had new inquiries that were coming from other sides or maybe both of them. Yeah. You know, uh, at first, you know, everybody was a bit shocked. I would say they didn't know what to make out of it, uh, how to prepare. Everybody was trapped for money. You know, if they will be. Uh, having enough liquidity to to go over this crisis, so mm -hmm. everybody uh, just stopped, uh, canceled all the ongoing orders and so on. On the other side, certain companies that were developing projects with us didn't have any other uh, selling channel that they could use to get uh, revenue. So there was also a huge pressure from a couple of companies. If we can speed up the development process and if we can, uh, you know, deliver the web shop early. So in one of the cases we did, and it's been a, a huge life savior for, for them because this is, this was one of the only ways they, they could sell their products, you know? So this is also something that uh, we, we have to adapt. You know, Mika was involved with, you know, coordinating the team, you know, getting everybody together, communicating with the end client. I was, uh, it was stressful, but on the other side, I think that we, we came on top of it and mm -hmm. we, they have a really happy customer because of it yeah yeah it was actually it was pretty good situ situation opportunity to call all of our clients and talk with them as you know uh we don't have time for this in most cases and this was definitely the, the best time to do it to just talk with them and it was great actually for this cool did you guys see some large spikes in, in uh, usage or, or shopping? Did some of your clients had some like ridiculous uh, spikes? Oh, For yeah. example, everybody knows the story of, of, of Zoom when uh, before the virus, they had like 10 million users per day. And like after a couple of days of virus, they had like around 200 million users. That's why they had so many security issues and everything. Mm -hmm. what, what happened with your clients? Well, it was, uh, you, you know, Black Friday, uh, you know, traffic and revenue is quite high in comparison with other other periods of, uh, of the year. Uh, uh -huh. With a couple of clients, we beat the records, you know, on a daily basis. So it was something really extraordinary, you know. Uh, when you look into the, the data analytics data, it's, it was crazy. You, you cannot imagine somebody can buy so many things online in a same day so many orders coming through so for a couple of our clients this was really a, a really good period i would say when, when they were growing in revenue instead of you know uh having issues with with revenue and what are actually people buying like what kind of stuff <laughs> all kind of stuff actually i don't think that uh, they're just grocery groceries all kind of stuff i mean you or def definitely you need baby uh, equipment, or, I mean, yeah. diapers and yeah. stuff, that's basic. But also, what, alcohol for sure, beers. Yeah, yeah. Pets, pet uh, merchandise, uh, so animal merchandise, I would say. Sporting, Sporting pretty high. Sporting uh, equipment. Cosmetics, uh, certain apparel as well. Uh, sporting equipment, yeah. Um, technical uh, hardware, I would say, also. So, yeah. So <laughs> everything. I'm, 
I was definitely one of, of sporting equipment, the customers. So yeah, I know how I did like feel the, the panic started when the gyms closed and everything. So I was like, let's, let's buy, let, let's buy everything we, we could possibly can for like normal workouts at home. But yeah, it's definitely interesting to, to, in your mindset to have that kind of transition and well, uh, uh, be at the end of the end of it. So cool. Uh, maybe now we can uh, backtrack a little bit and go into the history of Optiva, uh, if you guys agree. So, Miha, you were the, the you founded the company in uh, two thousand nine. So it's been eleven years of your company, and I, I com- ten years was last year, and that, that's a big milestone. I congrat- congratulate you on that. Thank you. Uh, very cool. You, you've been doing uh, SEO before you started the company, right? Exactly. What gave you the motivation to start your own company? Why did you start it? What's the, the initial power to in, inside of you to this start will be shocking. This will be shocking. Money. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, really, um, it, was, it was... I was dreaming about laying at the beach drinking a beer and money would just fly into my bank account. That was the main uh, main wish, I would say. <laughs> did it come true? Sorry? And did it come true like that easy? <laughs> no, I, I would say so. <laughs> But I'm glad. Um, I'm a workaholic, so I can't imagine not working. Yeah, but uh, as you ask, I started actually with with developing some basic websites and then after that i saw that a lot of traffic is coming through some search engines and after that i discovered that's called search engine optimization and i started to work on that that was in high school and i didn't go to to college i mean i did go for a half a year but after that i saw that uh, there is a big opportunity for me if i go full in into business and i'm very glad that i did it because it was it was i mean this journey of entrepreneurship is so it's so amazing it gives you so many things it's unimaginable you mentioned the world chicago fellowship program that's one of those things that you just have to have to experience you have to just go for it also those uh, in internships erasmus and stuff like that i would say if you can use it go for it hobbies do a lot of hobbies i made a lot of contacts out of hobbies and i did of course use them uh, uh, when i uh, started to search for a client uh, clients can, and can you- uh, my goal actually was to, to make a company with great culture where um, people don't hate the boss. I can't say that that uh, happened. I think they hate me sometimes, but I really try. Uh, I'm doing my best to, uh, to change that, I would say, to change the perception of, of, of a boss. Because I, don't, I really don't think that we, as uh, leaders, are... Uh, we, we want the best for our people, but sometimes decisions are not so simple as we'll give you uh, as much money as you want. It, it's not so simple. Okay. But it's hard to, to understand for people that weren't in our shoes. I, I agree with you. I agree. Would they, David, would you, would you say he's a good boss? Obviously, uh, on this call, you have to. Well, <laughs> I have to say yes, you know. <laughs> no, I, I'm joking, really. Uh, I met Mika actually when he was still uh, um, kind of in a, a, a sales ship position. He was selling for up web. And I was actually uh, his competitor. We met at the client together. And the client was, was asking us questions, you know, uh, we are both there, you know. Uh, and he started to, to, to discuss certain issues about, you know, what the the client wanted and I remember that I was listening to him and I, I said okay this is something that I totally agree with this is something that I would start with probably as well you know and we, we from the first uh, minute had this connection you know I, I had 
huge respect because he wasn't bullshitting, you know, uh, and saying some, some sleazy sales uh, uh, lingo and so on. And but he was straightforward. He told the client what he needs, what he thinks the client doesn't need, you know, and how he can help the client, you know, to achieve the end goal, you know. And I had a similar approach. So we, we connected afterwards, went for a drink, and you know, the rest is history. So and yeah, he's a good boss because he's really demanding, and uh, you know, in a way where he's expecting for everybody to to grow personally, professionally. You know, to, to keep on learning, experiencing new stuff, and uh, improving his uh, uh, his work, I would say, and uh, this is something I really appreciate. And it's it's uh, sometimes sometimes it's challenging, but in a good way, I would say. You know. Well, that's definitely nice to to hear. The, those kind of stories are really encouraging, and I would love to hear them more from from people saying saying that about their uh, their employers. So, Mika, uh, you mentioned some kind of hobbies were uh, like helping you connect with clients. Can you give us an example? Yeah, for example, skiing instructor. I was, uh, I was a ski instructor for like 10 years and I met a lot of parents, of course. <laughs> and those parents worked, are working, still working in, a, in, in interesting companies and also a student's club. Uh, local students club what else um, actually I was working with kids a lot and it helped me it helped me in kind of way I can't describe exactly in what kind of way but it did help me yeah yeah and if I would do it again I would definitely definitely travel more that's something uh, like I said Erasmus and stuff like that. Otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with what, what did I do uh, as a hobby in my... And football, for example, sports, big part of my life, uh, stuff like that. Way really cool. I, I also love skiing. And we talked, you know, that I was a, a professional skier yeah. shortly before I, had in, in, before I injured myself. But um, it's definitely a cool sport. And uh, skiing can maybe be a good example because... On, when you go to skiing, usually people that have a little bit more money go go skiing because it's an expensive sport, to be honest. And sure. that's a way to meet people that need stuff, that need, that have companies that are entrepreneurial. So, so I know, simple. Yeah, I know a guy who is a ski instructor in Switzerland, and he's a kind of guy for those very rich people. They, actually, they those people come with bodyguards and with, with choppers and stuff like that, helicopters. So they're very rich, and he made a lot of connections. Those, I mean, really <laughs> connections, <laughs> really rich people. <laughs> uh, cool. Do the bodyguards keep with him, with him together? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, cool. But uh, also. You mentioned student club and uh, going to college and that kind of the period of life. That that's like a perfect transition because I have a, a prepared question about that. And I know uh, David, you mentioned that you were very, very active when you were a student. Maybe for a younger audience, I when when I started my career, I met so many people that were active in in their student life in many organizations and. I can see that clearly they are ahead of of rest of the let's say competition because they had many opportunities to, to experience some kind of business uh, activities, organize various events, be part of some some kind of community team, and that kind of stuff. Would you say that uh, being uh, active as a student uh, influenced your career in any way or helped you? Or made you like uh, like we said uh, previously many connections that maybe uh, helped you kick kickstart your career. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Actually, I opened my first company when uh, I was around twenty three years old, and it was a direct consequence of uh, you know my my network social network. I would say uh, when I was a student, I was a part of 
uh, let's say student politics or not really politics it was more more or less like um, how to help other colleagues uh, you know to to uh, improve the student life i was a part of the student union uh, in charge of social affairs and healthcare and uh, as such you know i i had to be connected with other students around the university we in Ljubljana have one of the biggest universities in Europe, uh, around uh, 80,000 students altogether, so it's quite big. And so we had a lot of opportunities, you know, to organize different events, to be also negotiating on the, the part of students uh, towards the government. And from time to time, we, we had in our uh, social network more than 1,000 students that were attending events, you know, uh, and this was like a, a, a short, short group, you know, then you had friends and uh, it was even a bigger community altogether. And with uh, a couple of friends from that time, you know, we were thinking what to do, how to, you know, either to get a job or to maybe create ourselves uh, a job. And we opened a company and uh, one of my friends joined and uh, I'm really happy that I had this opportunity. It, it didn't go well. It uh, ended after a couple of years, but the experience is, you know, it's like MasterCard, it's priceless, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Soft skills are pretty big, big part of it. I'm sure that we all did yeah. start developing our soft skills because of those events, those uh, communities, those jobs. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I learned the most after after I opened my company because you know before that everything is theoretical you seem you know how the world uh, the world works but then you know you're pushed into the pool and you have to swim <laughs> and you know you have to get clients you have to sell something uh, you have to uh, recognize what the market wants you know and what doesn't want you, you're not supposed to be afraid of, of failures you kind of, uh, you know, learn how to accept failures and how to, from failures, grow to opportunities and seize the opportunities and convert them to something better. So yeah, it's it's something that really learned me how how to how to work even now. I would say. And how did you feel? Like I don't know what the situation in Slovenia, but in my country, people are there's like a certain stigma when it comes to failure. And uh, if you fail, they like a little bit, co the community judge, judged you, right? Yeah. So uh, how did you feel after you had to close your company? Like, did you have that like mindset in your head? Like, I got to move on, who cares? Like I learned a lot of stuff and uh, I'm going to move on and, and do better things in my life or you, you had trouble overcoming it? Well, to be honest, I'm a perfectionist. If we're talking about how I work, yeah. It was it was difficult. It was difficult, but what I got out of it was even more important because of it. Because it was a difficult time for me. I had to adjust and I had to over overcome. So now, when I look back, it you know something like that wouldn't be a, a challenge anymore. So yeah, it was it was hard on on one side, and uh, the Slovenian culture is in a way it's pretty strict. I would say um, if somebody does not succeed, you know. His, pretty fast branded as a loser, somebody that's not able to succeed. On the other hand, I would say what's also peculiar about Slovene culture is if you're very successful, everybody is envious. So, you know, you have to be somewhere in between. And I hate this, you know, to be <laughs> middle in the crowd, you know, I would like to stick out and to move, uh, you know, borders and, and to, to, to uh, figure how to improve the world, you know, and I, this is again something that I, I really appreciate how Micha is approaching the business, you know, and and how he's gathering all this critical critical mass of really great people together in in Optweb. I think we currently have more than fifty people, which is, you know, something that amazes me still. You know, I, I cannot believe it. Yeah, and he overcome, and he also had some some challenging times, and yeah. It's, it's something that I really appreciate because we are uh, leading by example, you know, because when you're maybe going to a bar and everybody just complaining, oh, how life is bad, you know, nothing is getting better. 
And on the other side, you have these good examples, you know, that made it, you know, that uh, pushed the, the, the limit further, you know, and it's uh, a source of optimism. I really like that. I couldn't agree more, but uh, I thought that Slovenia didn't have that kind of stigma as we do, but it seems that we are quite similar in, in that uh, that kind of look in, in, into failure. So yeah, cool. And I, and I exactly know what you say about like there are positive examples in the country. Also, Jez Guru is now over 50 people. We open the office in Novi Sad, Serbia also. And it's like, I don't, I don't want to brag, brag or what, but like we will, we love being an example of, of positive things happening in the country because there's so many, many negative news and, um, uh, I hope that will that will end up end sometime soon, and people will switch the mindset to like let's let's do something productive and let's work on uh, becoming better. But uh, also let's let's get back to to Optiveb and uh, like your early early stages of, of of development. You you guys been doing SEO right? That that was the primary uh, source of 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 services you provided, right? Yeah. So how much do you think SEO changed? Uh, I know that uh, you probably could influence SEO a lot in those days, but now uh, algorithms, Google, it's getting tougher, or at least I, I read stories about it getting tougher and tougher to, to influence SEO. What, what's the situation right now? Yeah, I mean, back in the days it was childlessly it was so easy. It's unimaginable right now how easy it was. <laughs> it just uh, entered some keywords and made some blog articles on the other sides, websites, and that was it. You are you are on the first page. <laughs> right now, currently, it's more complicated. You have to have very good website, uh, speedy website, um, technically perfect. Uh, with a lot of content, with a lot of backlinks, refreshed, everything. It's 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 very complicated. And for example, with a new website, with a new domain, you can't do much. You have to have some credibility in the domain already. So yeah, it's totally different. I can compare it at all. From from the stuff you mentioned, what do you think it's most important? Like. I know that a lot of stories are seeing backlinks, but do you agree or disagree? On the long term, uh, I mean, in the long term, it's everything mixed, combined. In the future, just backlinks won't uh, help you for sure. I mean, just backlinks, you don't have it. Is that you don't stood a chance? Uh, uh -huh. So really mixed for sure. Uh, a little bit of backlinks from big new sites, for so for example, PR articles some forums some blogs some of course social proof mm -hmm. all those things together it's not just one thing it's it's mixed for sure and and you had back in 2000 i think 10 or 11 you had your own product right called position spider what exactly. was that about? <laughs> where did you find that <laughs> i don't know if you know but you have on your optivap.com you have this uh really cool presentation about your tree. it goes with an elevator and yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's cool, it there. Right? yeah it, it is it's definitely a nice way to explain what how how it happened and to explain your journey yeah be uh, be being uh, different is definitely part of our culture so that's definitely being different um positions spider actually was pretty good product or uh, it was in in a great niche and if I would if I would go back ten years, I would invest a lot of money in it. Unfortunately, it was just for our internal use, and uh, so it was uh, a web, web app who tracked uh, where our keywords ranked for those uh, website on those our websites. So, for example, we had a couple of web pages with uh, translating services. And we, with that tool, we tracked where we are with those keywords. For example, translating from Slovenian to English. 
that was the keyword and we tracked where, where we are and send those reports to our clients. Actually, it was a good product. And like I said, it could be, it could be something that it would be spin off, for example, it could be. If we would invest a lot of money in it, into uh, the development, improvements, and of course, marketing. Because actually, I think that we have one company in Slovenia that made it with that product worldwide. So it could be that, I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> it was just for this, but it was a good product, good idea, I would say. I was almost the first one. But it, it, it's definitely there's something in uh, in having your own product because now you, as a service provider, you're really reliant on your customers. And when you have your own product, you can steer the company a little bit more, like let's say it's safely, or uh, you can plan a little bit more and that kind of stuff. So it's nice to have your own product. I think that right. uh, a lot of agencies or most of the agen agencies are thinking about getting, uh, about developing uh, internal uh, product. Uh, unfortunately, most of those uh, trials fail. I mean, fail because it's not easy. It's not easy at all. The market is, is saturated with all kinds of things, and it's hard to just make something new, make something out of the blue. I, I agree with you, but it's good. To, it's good that they are trying. Yeah, it's better than yeah. Not, not, not anything happening. So it's it's definitely because we have also we tried and we are now developing a completely new product. It's going to be a e learning platform for kids, something like a Udemy uh, for kids in uh, our local languages here. And that can uh, be applied to Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, primarily, then Slovenia and other countries that speak other languages. Nice. But, uh, but it's uh, it's definitely a challenge, as you say. Like it's not easy taking your attention to other places and uh, not uh, giving you the opportunity to to focus on on uh, it gives you the opportunity to focus on the core of your business, but it's it's dividing the, the attention to something else. Exactly. And you, need to, you need to plan and you need to stay like strong and uh, think a lot uh, how you're going to do it if you're going to do it properly. And obviously, there's a lot of money poured in and every month into the development. So it's mm -hmm. not it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, I thought so. So, so your your offices of Optiweb are in Escofia Loca, a uh, town located I don't know how many how many kilometers from Ljubljana, but it's yeah, yeah twenty minutes of, of driving from Ljubljana, thirty minutes of driving. What are the advantages of, of being in Skopje Loka, not in Ljubljana? Because uh, both uh, both things have their own advantages and disadvantages. Ljubljana is a larger city; like you're in the midst of everything uh, that's happening. You're you have maybe a little bit more of opportunities, but uh, why Shkofi Loka? Why not move to Ljubljana at some point? If different uh, reasons. One of the reasons is because I was uh, living near Shkofi Loka, and it, it was easier for me to start working here instead of Ljubljana. Uh, like I mentioned, we, we are trying to be different. And not being in Ljubljana means that you are different. <laughs> so, some I would say a couple of years ago, uh, people were calling us this optive, uh, this company from <laughs> Skopje Loka. You know, <laughs> this company from Skopje Loka. It's what I mean. It's it's what's wrong with Skopje Loka? It's 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 not Ljubljana. I agree, but uh, still, it's a city, small city. I, I think that um, location wasn't a problem in the history, in the back days, and it won't be a problem in the near future at all, because as this coronavirus happened, remote work will, will change. Uh, the whole the culture of working in the office will definitely change. We already did some questionnaires in term, I mean, in, um, in connection with uh, how are people feeling at home. Are they productive? Are they planning to? Do they want to 
come back to the office as soon as possible? Do they want to stay at home for a couple of weeks? And answers were pretty interesting. They were all saying, yeah, I'm actually pretty productive at home. It was quite difficult first week or two, but after that I adopt and it's great. I'm, I think I'm working less and do more. I also love that I have more time with family, that I don't have that um, traffic problems mm. and all of that stuff. So I think that in the future we will work in the office for two days per week or three days, it depends. And at least one day or two days we will be at home. Do you remember certain we were in, uh, in Chicago? People at Fridays, right? They did, they, mm -hmm. I mean, almost a lot of them work from home. Do you remember that? Fridays. Yeah, yeah. Friday. Where are the people? Yeah. So I think I, that this will happen uh, in our country as well. In our case. Yeah. You know that before the, the coronavirus, there was a Microsoft uh, like test in Japan when they tried uh, for for day work week, and uh, people were twenty. I I don't know the exact percentages. But they were more productive with four, uh, four day work week than five day work week. So there's definitely there something, and uh, especially if you live in a bigger city, then not uh, having to drag yourself through the traffic, uh, it's definitely a, a big, big plus. David, what's what's your standpoint of of uh, working from home? Do you do you like it, or uh, do you think it's it's sustainable it's uh, good or not i was just renovating my home and um, i took this opportunity you know to, to speed up and finish it so uh, currently i have new office space and it's it's like a charm because before you know if um, there are some some challenges uh, of work from home if, if you share the space with somebody else you know like my girlfriend and she's working as well from home so we had to arrange the space so she has a separate office. Well, no, it's not an office, it's actually the bedroom. <laughs> but yeah. still, you know, uh, we adapted uh, so everybody is working from different different room. Apart from that, I already did arrange my work dependent on where I had to go uh, to visit the clients around Slovenia. So sometimes two, two days per week, I was already, you know, mostly working from home, you know, because I'm only uh, I just need my my internet I need my phone and my car and that's it you know uh, there's a lot of interaction visiting uh, involved with uh, with business development and sales so this is something that was already happening before and now it just went up on a, another level so I, I really see a lot of good things coming out of it because also sometimes okay so you know the situation when uh, the customer wants to meet you, but they are not really prepared for the meeting. You know, mm -hmm. they, they have this, uh, okay, you, you have to visit us, but then you come there and they're like, okay, I didn't even prepare uh, any bullet points. I don't know what I want to, to ask you and so on. And now I think that this improved quite a lot because people saw and especially clients saw that online meetings are important and they took their time to prepare it. Uh, so to gather their thoughts, you know, to, to maybe do uh, a bit more about what they want to prepare certain briefs and so on. So I would say that a lot of meetings are more um, structured and uh, a bit more optimal than before. So it's interesting, I would say, in, in a way. And I, I really like that. I, I think that after we will return back into the office, there will still, you know, this component of visiting the, the, the clients will still remain. But I think it will be less meetings on demand. They will be able, we will be able to, to do a lot online as well. You know, and then in the, in the later stages, when you need somebody to shake his hand, you know, to, to close the deal, then, you know, we'll be present in, in person. Well, that's definitely interesting because it would make sense that people, when you are going to come and be physically there, that they would prepare. But obviously, they're not. And when you're doing it online, they're prepared. So it, it's counterintuitive, but it, it usually happens.
So, and you guys are, are specialized in uh, like transforming web presence for 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 clients, right? Mm -hmm. what, what does uh, what does the the process look like? From where do you start? Uh, are clients well educated in the field of IT or digitalization? Uh, do how do you approach them? Oh, that's a difficult question because um, we offer so so many <laughs> uh, services to clients that yeah okay uh, there are a couple of touch points I would say usually in, in in the back there is some sort of outbound activity networking that's mostly run through Micha and certain other members of the team you know certain conferences uh, networking events and so on so we get a lot of inquiries uh, through through personal contacts so usually where we start is we have a client that has a problem and we address the problem so usually we, we get uh, certain contacts through Mika and Mika lays it out what what their problem is and then I get in contact and usually the the first uh, contact is just you know to get to know the, the client to dig uh, a bit deeper, you know, what their business model is, what their target audience is, and so on. So we, we ask a lot of questions. We try to qualify the client if we're a perfect match, because sometimes we're not, you know. And based on that, we, we move it further, or maybe we refer them to another company. That happens a lot as well, you know, especially when a couple of years back, we, we had quite a lot more clients, I would say, and uh, the project size was smaller. Average value was, I don't know, maybe a couple of thousand euros. And now we mostly start at a couple of tens of thousand euros in, in value of the projects, uh, if we can say. There are certain uh, differences if we support them in marketing, but still, you know, we, we tend to have bigger clients, more demanding clients, Clients that al that already have certain um, experience with digital world, and they need to step up. This is our, let's say, the best match that we are searching for. And then there's usually depends if we're developing an e-commerce site, uh, demanding complex e-commerce site. The the cycle can be also six months or more. You know. You do workshops, you get to know the client, then you propose like uh, a proof of concept or uh, uh, just to, to make a specification for them. And then if they're uh, happy with it, you go forward to development. And then afterwards, you move them to, to the marketing to, to support them to grow, you know? So yeah, there's a lot of activities. Uh, we have different pipelines, different processes. So dependent on who, who the end client is and what they need. Okay. Cool. So what I got from uh, what was really interesting for me there is that uh, networking and personal contact is still king, right? It's yeah. And LinkedIn. Yeah. and LinkedIn, right? Yeah, for sure. And personal How recommendation, for example, if some, some customer is really happy with you, you know, if they recommend you to, to their business audience, clients or, or I know maybe even a competitor you know this is this is something that you, you cannot you cannot buy it you know you have to earn it cool and when you say linkedin uh i know that you guys invest a lot of time in linkedin what would be like uh one advice one piece of advice to to people that are starting out to, to find clients on linkedin what should they focus on so you have uh, two options you can do it outbound. So just start writing uh, personal messages to, to your target audience. Or you can do inbound. You can try to uh, write LinkedIn posts and do inbound. But inbound is, of course, long term, but I would say more efficient. efficient. Um, and outbound is, I, I would say, instant. Um, you have to do a lot of uh, uh, hard working <laughs> research, yeah. research and stuff, but it, it's definitely one way to do it. Uh, for example, in my case, I, I'm trying with inbound always. 
and I'm trying to make a lot of great content that people like to read. And in the near future, future things, I mean, uh, people will remember me when they will start to think about, okay, I want to build a website. I, I, I was looking at that guy. He had a quite a, he had some interesting content regarding websites. Yeah, I will contact him. And then they come to me and make a contact and that's it. So you have to find something, some content where you are really good when you stand out and write about it. So that's, in my case, that's it. I'm, I'm trying to write great content about leadership, company culture, stuff that people like to hear. Yeah, and Miha, Miha is a real uh, LinkedIn influencer, aren't you? <laughs> I <Yeah>. try. <laughs> No, uh, to, to everybody listening, Mika really has some uh, good posts on LinkedIn and uh, knowledgeable in, in general. And they so are, be, they are be all sure. inspired uh, by real um, um, the work, um, situation. Right? Exactly. Cool. No, they're really, uh, I always stop and read what you, what you write. And uh, to be honest, I never like read something that I thought it's this is this is stupid or something like that. No, like really they're really good. So and then useful and I, I think everybody in the entrepreneurial world can take some advice from them. Thank you. So let's let's. Uh, I'm gonna be a little bit uh, of a geek because uh, I was always a gamer and I love playing games and everything. And from from your from your client list one pretty much stood out. So that was Corsair because they make like really nice PC housing and uh, many internal parts as, as RAM memory or uh, cooling and that kind of stuff. So you guys made a configurator for them, right? On a, and uh, you, OptiPep is uh, pretty, well, I would say that's a niche, right? configurators and that kind of stuff, because I, I, I can see that that's not your only project when it comes to, to those kind of uh, types. So uh, how did you land Corsair? And maybe that will be an interesting story for, for the gamers, listeners. <laughs> I can Please. just say it was through personal contact. Actually, the team from Slovenia is responsible for not just developing the web, part of it, but also the whole developing of this cooling stuff in general, but Corsair. So uh, we, we knew each other, we made something uh, similar in the past, and that was it. I'm not sure if uh, the audit audience is familiar with the project. They can uh, check it out at Corsair Liquid Cooling, uh, Liquid Cooling Solutions. Uh, they have it on the Corsair website. Uh, and uh, the problem that we're solving is, you know, if you're, I don't know, if you're not a geek and you want to liquid cool your uh, PC at home, that's gaming uh, configuration, let's say, you need certain guide uh, to, to guide you through all the steps, you know, what, uh, how much space is it there in, in uh, the computer case, you know, what motherboard is inside, you know, how many graphic cards you have and so on. And this configurator uh, actually helps you to, uh, you know, choose the right components and have your own custom made liquid cooling solution that Corsair then sends out to you and you can assemble it together. So it's, mathematically uh, speaking, you have 23 billion uh, variations of options but not all of them are actually compliable, uh, compliant, and uh, uh, certain are not even in stock and so on. So the, the configurator is, you know, calculating all these options, what, what is uh, possible to put in the system, and it helps you. And it's, yeah, it, we, we had a, a UI designer, and he got inspiration from actually playing computer games because we were researching, you know, what kind of a, user interface to prepare for the target audience that are gamers, you know? So there's a lot of uh, anecdotes that we can talk about. It's a huge project. We are really, really happy to be able to support Corsair 
and to build, you know, something uh, so great with them together. And there are a lot of opportunities to even, uh, you know, push it forward into to some other niche market. It's a great say, tool, I would say. Yeah, and the, 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 I mean, the Corsair, Corsair is not the only big name client you guys have. There's a like big bang the chain of electronic stores. Then you have like uh, some sport goods. Then you have uh, all kinds of interesting clients. So is there a lot of pressure when you work for those kind of corporations, or is it like still a startup vibe? Or well, <laughs> you know, we are growing together with our clients, and uh, as we are growing, you know, the processes get. Uh, more professional in a way, you know, for example, a couple of years back, quality assurance uh, was not uh, an issue that we were uh, dedicating a lot of time to, but now we have to. Cybersecurity is also really important. Uh, GDPR is really important. So compliance, let's say legal compliance is important, becoming more and more important. So yeah, you know, we landed in... Uh, this month or last month, we landed with uh, Renault, Nissan for the whole Adriatic area. And it's a huge contract and it's really interesting uh, project that we are working with them. So yeah, with, uh, you know, uh, huge power comes huge responsibility as well. So yes, for sure, yeah, we, we feel the pressure you know, and we have to step up, you know. But this is also in, in the other way, I would say it's uh, a proof of uh, development in Optweb, you know. We're doing something right if, if we're landing this kind of clients. Yeah, I mean, we, we want that. We wanted that in the past already because we don't want to fall asleep on the projects. We want to grow and then definitely part of it being more responsible, having bigger clients and budgets. And what, what what's the biggest like challenge you have in Slovenia when growing? I know some certain certain things we had here uh, when it comes to people, when it comes like, do you, do you guys have some serious challenges that were hard to overcome? Obviously, you, you probably had them, but some of them maybe, and then some uh, knowledge uh, learned from, from overcoming them. I mean, in the near future, we'll definitely have to go abroad, abroad to Dach region, for example, because Slovenia is small. Uh, and we can still grow in Slovenia, but not much, I would say. And of course, with uh, other countries comes other challenges, bigger challenges. So that, that's our path. <laughs> what would you, what would you say regarding other challenges? Well, uh, to be honest, we are 50, around 50 strong, uh, as we mentioned before. And sometimes it's pretty difficult to land deals because sometimes, you know, if you would like to land a deal and support a client that's a bigger client, the capacity can be a problem, you know? Uh, because yeah. really soon they need like 20 developers only for this project, you know? And you have to make the ends meet, you know? So I, I, I think that uh, a lot of uh, pressure is being, uh, you know, uh, Mika has a lot of pressure how to find good talent, you know, how to uh, attract good developers, good project managers. We are, you know, growing the, the talent pool, you know. We have, uh, for example, a dedicated support team. We have a dedicated design team inside the company. We have a DevOps that we didn't have before, you know. Uh, we have a legal, a small legal department. We have an HR specialist inside, so, you know, if we are about to grow, you know, and get good talent, you know, also this um, really important functions inside a company uh, need to be there. So we are trying to gather the best that we can afford. And this is something that Mika is doing uh, mostly and doing really well together with the support of all of us, of, of course. But yeah, I would say the capacity sometimes is, is an issue. We are limited, you know. Uh, we can support we have to cherry pick the client as well you know i i feel you i definitely feel it when you when you said the the, the challenge I, like you know how you feel it in your stomach so it's the same same thing uh we're experiencing and and obviously you have to think about the future you have to think about what new things are going to come that's why for example 
I recently ventured into AWS professional services because AWS is the largest cloud provider in the world. And uh, it made a lot of sense for us because we had DevOps and a lot of people interested in, it, interested in, in AWS. So uh, we did it and, and we, are, we formed our own data science uh, sector. And uh, like you said, as we grew, we have, uh, previously we only had administration and development. And as we grew, we added HR, we added our own marketing, we have our own marketing and sales department, we have our own um, uh, design part, we have uh, quality assurance. So to, to, to sustain the growth, you need to, to make departments and uh, invest in each one of them and uh, be sure to, pe- to have people learning new, new knowledge and uh, oh, constantly progressing. So, but I, I definitely feel, uh, feel your problems and uh, it's something uh, that, that we are experiencing too. But uh, you guys also are specialized in uh, PIM, right? It, it's short for uh, uh, personal information management, right? Am I right? It's product information management. Product information management. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, uh, you've been even specializing further in PINCORE, which is a, a special software in the field. And uh, that, that may be in the field of e-commerce helped you attract some kind of clients and uh, put you on the map or did it? Yeah, the, there is a story. There is a Can story. Tra- sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I just wanted to, to share with you and your audience, you know, the, the story, how we came uh, across this uh, strange abbreviation PIM, you know, it was actually a web store that we wanted to develop for Intersport for the Adriatic region. And their biggest issue was, you know, uh, there was a lot of data they had to enrich before they could put it online. And this, you know, they needed a lot of people and a couple of months to enrich the data to the quality that it was okay to to move it online. So they already had all the items in stock. They had the items in the brick and mortar stores. But two months after, you know, they could put it online. So it was a big negative point for them. And uh, they approached us and, uh, you know, they wanted to, to have a solution for this. So the, the PIM is actually, it's a, a centralized database for products. All the descriptions, categorization, pictures, you know, maybe even videos and so on. Uh, all the connections between different products and so on. And the end result now is actually they order half a year in advance. In a couple of months, they already have everything enriched. And when the stock comes, the next day, the items are online. So so we sped up the process for a couple of months. And it made a huge impact on their sales. And also, the quality of data is better now. And also, all the localization, translations, you know, can be pushed instantly. To, to different markets and they, it's proven to be uh, such a good success story that we are including uh, a theme let's say a component uh, to the e-commerce with i think every project that we start now for our clients so yeah and it has for example you it's an omni-channel tool you can have your own e-commerce you can push a feed of data on amazon on alibaba on eBay. you know for example uh, you can even automate uh, catalogs you know, printing catalogs so it's quite quite interesting and really really powerful uh, tool that solves a lot of problems especially for retailers but also you know for uh, b2b business and some other uh, possible niche markets well, I've been then using a product you made and uh, I didn't even know it because when this started, I ordered some stuff from Intersport. So thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it, you know. <laughs> I think we, sh- we should not drag this out because we-, we commented that we don't want this to turn into Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> but uh, 
to conclude, guys, I would love I love to conclude stuff with some uh, like final thoughts and an advice to to the audience. What would you say if somebody wants to, to start like similar entrepreneurial journey like Optivab, and then they want to start an e-commerce agency or an agency of, of for development in general? What would be your advice for them? I know this this sounds like I, I'm promoting uh, t- for you to start the competition, but uh, the the market is big enough, I think, for everybody. I think that uh, uh, don't start uh, too too big. Start a niche. Go into some niche. Find it and start developing there. Like you said, it's a uh, it's a big space, but you have a lot of out of competitors. And if you can't find the niche, you will have a lot of troubles to, to grow. Uh, so pick a niche, definitely pick a niche. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, it's, the opportunities are, are vast. You know? For example, we didn't even touch what the trends are in, in e-commerce or, uh, you know, in, in, in sales online. You know, you have augmented reality, virtual reality. You have, uh, you know, speech, uh, speech uh, optimization, voice uh, recognition and stuff, you know. And they get me wrong, but we can, we can touch them. Like we, we can add five minutes. It's not if, if it's important. I think the audience should hear it. So, uh, yeah. This, this is Go something ahead. that we see as uh, as opportunities for for the future. You mentioned uh, configurators. We already uh, included certain 3D models in in the Corsair configurator. IKEA is doing uh, quite a lot in developing, you know, the augmented reality when you use your phone or or VR goggles, where you move around your home and you can already place the the furniture that they have on on the online store you can place it in your side in, in your home you know and this is this is the future and you know the applications of, of the, the technology is you know you know use your imagination and um, when we are looking forward what we can offer to our clients we are you know in a way uh, trying to preempt you know what the next big paradigm shift will be you know where where the technology will go because now you know we, we are already, everybody has uh, responsive uh, uh, websites. Uh, the omni-channel is already a standard, you know. And I think that the Internet of Things and the augmented reality is the next big thing together with speech recognition uh, and certain algorithms, AI. Uh, what is also really important, I would say, is uh, marketing automation is getting pretty, pretty, you know, vast in, in amount of features that it offers and artificial intelligence as well, you know, so programmatic marketing, you know, the, the, the field and opportunities are so vast that, yeah, everybody that has this ambition and passion to help somebody to grow, please do it because we are trying to develop the, the ecosystem here in Slovenia as well, not to, to dump the prices, but to uh, increase the value, you know. So that's why we refer certain clients to, to uh, let's say, some companies that are partnering with us, and we try to develop them and give them, you know, our experience and uh, help them grow as well, you know. And we also have good connection with creation companies, and now we, we, we know your company, and I'm sure that, you know, we'll be able to, to help each other in certain ways in the future. Well, I, I certainly hope so, because in, in terms of mindset, I, I think we're quite uh, similar and, and we want uh, quite similar things and uh, we think long term on, on both sides. So I think that's that's really important. And I, I certainly, like I said, I certainly hope so that we will have the, the opportunity to work together at least. Great. Well, well uh, guys, I think this is a nice point. To end this conversation, uh, to personally, I think it was really productive. We shared a lot of knowledge, knowledge and uh, interesting stories from from Slovenia. I hope uh, that uh, listeners think the same, and uh, the future listeners will have something useful to to have to to put out of of, of this podcast. And um, thank you again for joining me. Optiveb is definitely a cool company that uh, everybody should look out. 
to search just OptiWeb and uh, see what kind of projects they've been doing and see how cool it is. So again, thank you. It, it was a pleasure. Well, uh, enjoy, enjoy Slovenia, enjoy uh, the beautiful weather that's coming. And uh, I hope the, the whole situation with, with the virus will relax even more and uh, we will continue living our lives normally as previously. I'm not sure that will happen uh, shortly, but uh, I hope so, certainly. Thank you, Serha. Stay yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us and all the best, you know. Thank you, guys.